live from KSAT 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. And we start with this. The drought and extreme heat is really threatening the livelihood of farmers all across South Texas. Although water sources are still running, farmers in our area tell us the ground simply doesn't cool off, so it's harder to produce crops. Alicia Barrera visited with the Jensky family in Fredericksburg. They began their business with a few hundred peach trees back in 1961. Now they're struggling, but they're not discouraged. In its 61 years of existence, Yensky Orchards has been through it all. We've seen a lot of hail, we've seen a lot of drought, which is what we're experiencing right now. Travis Yensky inherited his father's orchards and says this year, unfortunately, is shaping up to be similar to 2011. We had uh, 10 inches and 55 points of rain all year. Right now we're in the middle of June. We've had five and a half inches here. With no rain, the crops depend solely on constant irrigation row by row, with the water from their well. This intense heat constantly, I think that's keeping the peaches small and they're not ripening either. We just have to be very diligent. You know, we, um, if you skip a day, it can be detrimental. It's a dire situation that has led other farmers along the 290 corridor to shut down, like Ernst Markets. They've been in the business for 75 years, but the owner tells me it's the dry conditions that lead to not enough produce and not enough money to hire help. To balance their supply this season, Yensky Orchards is not offering peach picking and instead focusing on its retail store. That's what keeps us going. Uh, we have people depending on us, so we choose that. For now, the Yenskis say they'll keep watering as long as they can. We'll live through it. <laughs> Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. Yeah, we certainly hope that things get better for them, although maybe that's not likely this week. Here's a live camera looking at our Southside City Cam. 97 degrees. John Paul, definitely a hot one out there. We saw a brief dip in temperatures. Now we're back into the 100s, hitting those 100s. And it's just more of this this weekend, right? More of the same. And I know that's what those farmers don't want to, want to hear. You just saw the situation there. The drought is so bad across parts of our area. Exceptional drought for parts of the hill country where Alicia was earlier today. And that drought's likely going to continue with the forecast that we have in place. The aquifer also continues to fall down half a foot to 635.7 today. And your pollen count we have molds and pigweed, that's it, they're both low. We got rid of some of that Saharan dust. It may make a return by the middle part of next week. A look at our hot seven day forecast is coming up in just a bit. Thanks for that, Justin. Today on the News at Five, we told you about the case of Melvin Quinney. The Texas Innocence Project is trying to get him exonerated. In 1991, he was convicted of sexually assaulting his son. Now back then, Quinney's son says that he did it, but now he's saying that testimony was a lie. He's recanting. The son also said that he was made to believe that his father was a satanic cult leader. Now, if you remember, this case happened during a time in American history called satanic panic. Our Erica Hernandez has more on what satanic panic is and how it may have played a role in people wrongfully being convicted. From music to movies, Satanism was being talked about in pop culture in the 80s and 90s. But that eventually led to some serious accusations. This had reached the point where uh, people were actually being uh, accused of, of crimes uh, and actually being, uh, in some cases, convicted for it. Dr. Joseph Laycock is a professor of religious studies at Texas State University and describes this time as the satanic panic. During this time in courtrooms across the country, people were being wrongfully convicted and accused of being in satanic cults and ritually abusing children. These groups trying to claim that uh, Satanists are sort of seducing our children and, and, and taking over America. In 1991, a couple in Austin who owned a daycare were sentenced to 48 years for abusing several children during a satanic ritual. Also in 1991 in Bear County, Melvin Queenie was sentenced to 25 years for the sexual abuse of his son. And in 1994, four women in San Antonio were accused of raping two little girls. So far, the couple in Austin and the women known as the San Antonio Four have been exonerated. But Queenie still awaits his exoneration. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. In other news, now the man who admitted to beating his mother to death in her apartment two years ago just learned his fate. In May, Michael Wayne Kerbo pleaded guilty to murder. Today, he was sentenced to 35 years as part of a plea deal. 
Back in January of 2020, Kerbo's 76-year-old mother was found dead in her apartment in Balcones Heights. And now Kerbo has to serve about 17 and a half years in prison before he's eligible for parole. Tonight, San Antonio police are searching for the suspect involved in a stabbing on the northwest side. It happened around 2 this morning at the Fredericksburg Road apartments in the 3400 block of Fredericksburg Road. SAPD says the suspect approached a man in his 20s while he was at his mailbox. The suspect stabbed the victim three times after he refused to give the suspect any money. The victim was taken to University Hospital. VIA President and CEO Jeffrey Arndt gave a speech on the state of transit today, talking about some of VIA's plans and also where they stand. Garrett Berger talked with him about the status of one of VIA's most ambitious projects, which you know as the Advanced Rapid Transit. VIA's President and CEO Jeff Arndt is optimistic about the state of transit and the state of VIA's efforts to build an advanced rapid transit system. The time is now. We are on fire. We are in the fast lane, but we need to take advantage of this opening and opportunity because, like I said, it can close. ART, as it's better known, is essentially bus trains, typically running in dedicated lanes. It's central to VIA's plans for the future. VIA has the funding it needs for a north to south corridor identified including a federal grant they're in line for that would cover almost half of the $320 million price tag. We'll be in final design, I think, in 2024, so not far from now, and it will be in construction then 25, 26, and we'll open in 27. They also have plans in the works for a second quarter, running east to west. While Arndt is optimistic about getting the feds help with that too, he also needs to find money to put up to match it. As we say, we look under every rock and then we look under whatever's under every rock. They can't get federal money until they get the local match, but they can push forward in the meantime. Oh, we're moving into design. We're going to go into, we're going to go to the federal government probably, probably within the next 12 months and ask them to start putting it through the federal funding cycle. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Um, you know, that VIA bus started, you You started thinking about traffic when you saw that, right? So let's talk about that. Here's I-10 at Provent, which is on the south side. And you can see that camera's turned, so you can see a lot of the, of the sky there, but we can't tip it down. But trust us, as you see right there, you're looking at a lot of traffic there in both directions. 606 right now. It's Father's Day weekend. You have Juneteenth celebrations all across our city. So right now, this is what you're getting, just a lot of traffic. Now, tomorrow, the Texas Kidney Foundation and SACAM is going to host the third annual Juneteenth Knife. It's at the Missions Game, and organizers are hoping that it encourages people to learn more about kidney disease and screenings. Actor and comedian Reginald Ballard is going to throw out the first pitch. He sat down with our R.J. Marquez to discuss his battle against kidney disease. I never thought about until it happened to me when I needed a kidney. Then I was like, you know what, this is a process. Reginald Ballard, best known for his role as bro man on the hit sitcom Martin, lived with kidney disease nearly all his life. I remember having to go, I, my mother said, boy, you look, your feet and stuff look swollen. So he took me to the hospital, they told her I had kidney disease. Despite the early diagnosis, Ballard said he didn't start having serious problems until he turned 54. I was always in shape. You know, I never, um, never had a drink in my life. Then one day, man, I just, you know, my hands swollen, my feet swollen, and um, then he said, hey, now you have to, you know, do dialysis. As a spokesperson for the foundation, Ballard says that it's never too early to get screened. The Texas Kidney Foundation reports that 90% of Americans don't know they have chronic kidney disease, and it's most common among African Americans and Hispanics. Black and Latino. I mean, we, we, our diets are terrible, and that's why we have the problem that we have. And it was very important for me, man, because I've been through it, and I wouldn't want, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. We have 800 new people go on to uh, dialysis every year. Tiffany Jones Smith says the foundation is testing 8,000 people this year for kidney disease. And the reason being is that diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and obesity are the four leading causes of kidney disease. Ballard got his transplant as part of a unique swap that included his wife Edith's kidney. His outlook on life now forever changed. You know, you see in your bloodline, your lifeline going through a machine, you know, and that was, you know, hard. I felt that, you know, it's very important to let people know my story. RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. Now, we have come to know that self-exams and mammograms are the best ways to catch breast cancer early. But our awareness in the U.S. on how to prevent death from breast cancer is special. It's especially the case for countries that struggle not just to get the word out, but to fund it. 
Ursula Perry takes a look at how a South Texas woman plans to save lives in breast cancer hotspots in a very stylish way. Argentina, known for its delicious asadas and beautiful pampas. But what you won't see on the tourism sites is its breast cancer rate. Of all cancers, for some reason, breast cancer is far and away the most prevalent and deadly there. Argentina has one of the highest breast cancer death rates. So if you detect it early, you can still heal it, right? And it, it really has a I mean, huge positive impact. And so began Sylvia Kampschoff's journey this year, using her experiences as a visitor to Argentina to help the women there who are driving the rates up by not having the means to get screened. Every time I come back with at least three bags, and everybody, like starting at the airport, asks me, where did you get the bag? That's how her company, Pata, short for Patagonia, was born. A portion of the proceeds from each of these handmade bags goes to giving a needy woman in Argentina a mammogram. This type of leather works is very common in Argentina. It's known for its leather and its saddles. What she's done is she's made it very stylish and it's gonna save lives. She's teamed up with the Austral University Hospital in Pilar to get women through the door for their breast cancer status, which is often their first brush with modern medical care. It's not just the mammogram. If you find something, you have to do a second ultrasound or a second mammogram. And then once something is detected, then they would pay for it. When she returns to Argentina in November, she expects to have helped 200 women get their mammograms. She says it's just the beginning of what she hopes will one day be a worldwide program, one bag at a time. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Coming up, the longest cave in the state is now going to be preserved forever. Thanks to a conservation easement agreement, we're going to take you inside the Honey Creek Cave after the break. Customers are going to expect to see anywhere from 15 up to 30% increases on some fireworks. Yeah, what else is new? Tonight on the Night Beat, celebrating the red, white, and blue could cost you some extra green this year. The rising prices ahead of the 4th of July and what you need to know to enjoy your fireworks safely. Also celebrating Pride in San Antonio, your sneak peek at the city's first ever Pride River Parade and the barges that will bring it to life this weekend. That is tonight on the Night Beat. All right, recently the owners of Honey Creek Spring Ranch in Kamau County reached a conversation or conservation easement agreement with the Nature Conservancy and Texas Parks and Wildlife. This means the land will be preserved forever. And that is key because that piece of land, which is home to Honey Creek, is also where you'll find Honey Creek Cave, which is the longest and some would argue one of the most important caves in the state. Now you can't go there because it's not open to the public, but Meteorologist Justin Horn and Sarah Spivey got the chance to go there and check it out. They're going to show us how important and also fragile this ecosystem truly is. We are at Honey Creek Spring Ranch, pristine land that has just been protected by a conservation easement. The land here looks exactly as it did 200 years ago. It's been in this family five to six generations and it really is untouched and it's beautiful. It's still my favorite cave and it's still impressive to me even after all these trips. It's still an incredibly impressive cave. So this is our first time yeah. kind of going in something like this. Advice? Um, keep your head above water where you can. Uh, be careful, go slow. Cur uh, it's 100% success record. Everybody's gone in, has come out. Okay, Good. so we, we expect to continue that record today. I don't remember exactly how many times I've been in here, but it's well over 200. This section that we're doing today is one of the most decorated parts of the cave. It's 15, 20 feet wide, over your head deep for most all of it. And there's formations that come down from the ceiling into the water, so you have to weave your way through them in a lot of places. When you get up here, push your floaty stuff through, and then I'll give you my, my hand and I'll pull you through. There are a number of species in the cave, some aquatic, uh, some terrestrial. There are bats in the cave. It's the longest cave in the state. Uh, it's a major discharge point for the Trinity Aquifer. So Justin and I are 1,500 feet into Honey Creek 
concrete cave about 80 feet below the surface. And we've made it to this fascinating piece of this waterfall here. If you were to keep going, the cave would go on for another 20 miles. I've enjoyed being able to explore it all these years, and I hope that, that future generations of cavers can also in, enjoy it uh, and continue to add to its survey. Sarah, what you think? Amazing. And the water was so cool. It was beautiful to actually be in the aquifer. <laughs> we recognized how important this piece of property was. If they had decided to do the other thing, to, to sell it, um, the, the only people that could have afforded it would have been developers. And we might have houses right up on top of that spring, which would have diminished uh, everything about it. They have been some of the most incredible owners of any cave in this country. There could hardly be anything more important to the humans living in this area than to protect our water supply. And by protecting the land over the aquifer, you're protecting the water. And while you're doing that, you're also protecting wildlife. Yeah, it's all together. It's just amazing when you saw those pictures in there, them, you know, you guys, it must have been quite an adventure. And just the, the amount of spaces you guys squeeze into, you had to lay on your back. Yeah. I mean, I know I went into a cave and I thought I had you beat. Oh, yeah. yes. I thought I had you beat, but I think yeah. this one takes the cake. There were some tight fits, but you know, the thing about it, it's one of the most incredible things I've done. I mean, it was so beautiful, so incredible inside that cave. And to know that this is a conduit to the aquifer and what's been done to preserve it, it's just uh, just awesome. And uh, hopefully we'll put out some more videos and show you a little bit more. But that was uh, what we dealt with there in Honey Creek Spring Cave. And, and I do want to give special thanks to Gary, Kurt, John, and Helen for taking us in there. And, of course, the landowners for letting us, uh, letting us do that and give us access to that. So thank you so much. Let's talk about temperatures now. And uh, it was hot again today, 98 degrees. The official high here in San Antonio. No, we did not hit 100, but a few places around here did. 101 in Pleasanton. 100 in Gonzales, but as we often talk about, it's a trade-off. No, we didn't hit 100, but that was because we had a little added humidity today, and so the heat index was up above 100, so it felt that way. And as we go outside for you, beautiful scene there, 96 degrees. Uh, dew point is at 63, and a south-southeasterly breeze at about 10 miles per hour. Yesterday, those dew points were in the 50s. Today, in the 60s, and that made a little bit of a difference. Also. We noticed we had some clouds developing. We can see that on the visible satellite picture here. None of these that bubbled up, bubbled up into showers or storms, unfortunately. We wish they would have. And we had a couple east of us, but just nothing here. And uh, right now, temperatures are still in the 90s in most spots. 95 degrees, Holotus, 91 Bernie Station, 98 in New Braunfels, 90 Canyon Lake, 100 down there in Pleasanton and dew points still in the 60s as we talked about. And these numbers will jump back up overnight. We'll see more humidity as we head into tomorrow, at least tomorrow morning. And then the dew points will drop off a little bit again tomorrow afternoon. But you'll see dew points in the 70s to start. Current temperatures across the state. A lot of heat. No matter where you go, you can't escape it. 93 in Amarillo, 98 Dallas, 99 Waco, 93 in Houston, San Angelo sitting at 101. And as we look at the big picture here, uh, there is some rain for East Texas. Folks there are getting some much needed rain. You see the monsoonal rains out across parts of New Mexico, but we're stuck in the middle where there is nothing. High pressure still really in control and it's around the edges of this high pressure and there is a weak frontal boundary right there that is helping to spark some of that activity across the southeast. Severe weather for the East Coast, but it's close enough to us where it just keeps rain pretty much out of the picture and keeps us very warm. That's the case even going into next week. We need this thing to move out of the way, this he high. It just doesn't want to move, at least not enough to give us any significant chance for rain or any kind of cool down. And as we look at the forecast way ahead here, we're talking about uh, June 25th to July 1st. Looking down the line, just getting sort of a general idea here, we expect that that will be well above average for most of the state of Texas, and that includes right here in San Antonio. So not much changes. KSAT 12 hour forecast 90 degrees at 9 o'clock. We'll see temperatures fall into the 80s by midnight, 83 degrees, 82 at 1 a.m., 80 by 2 a.m., and then into the 70s by tomorrow morning. We will start to see a few more clouds developing. The, the clouds will be brief tomorrow morning. We don't expect them to last very long. What about your Father's Day weekend? Of course, we got Juneteenth on Sunday as well. Shaping up to be hot and humid. 99 tomorrow, just a small, small chance of a shower like today. And then 101 Sunday. And by the way, there's enough humidity there where the heat index may make it feel a little bit warmer than those temperatures you see there. Next week, uh -huh, we mm. see the pattern. Uh, 100 just about each and every day. Maybe 101 a couple of days there. So we mix it up some, but not in the way we want to. 
uh, hopefully somewhere down the line something something changes guys yeah it's a little too consistent for I agree us. all right Justin thank yeah. you from hot temperatures to hot water Greg Dallas Cowboys head coach find and it's a familiar one yeah and what's interesting is the owner uh, Cowboys owner Jerry Jones who revealed the find to us when we come back he's almost I guess proud of it what is Jerry's reaction to the fine of Mike McCarthy for the second straight offseason and the Aggies are in the college World Series how did they do against Oklahoma coming up Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. As we told you first on the night beat last night, Cowboys coach Mike McCarthy has been fined again for hosting two physical of practice during organized team activities. It's after McCarthy canceled the final day of the mandatory minicamp because, as he said, they had gotten in the work they needed to do in the first two days, even though the second day was a trip to Top Golf for a team bonding event. McCarthy was fined $100,000 by the league, and the team will lose one day in OTAs next year. That comes after McCarthy was fined $50,000 and the team an additional $100,000 last year for the exact same violation. According to the collective bargaining agreement, teams are not allowed contact during all season workouts and get this it was team owner Jerry Jones who broke the news and doesn't seem to be that concerned about it we got our coach fine he got it in a little more than uh, uh, physically that uh, uh, then maybe we've uh, bargained for but uh, uh, that's not the issue we've got a lot of good work in uh, we've got uh, really young players uh, not only the draft picks, but also really more free agents, college free agents that have a chance to help us this year than I've seen in a long time. Now, in the meantime, Jerry World or AT&T Stadium will be one of the host sites in America for the World Cup in 2026. That was announced by FIFA, the world governing body of international soccer that also includes NRG Stadium in Houston. Jerry says he built AT&T Stadium just for these huge moments. This stadium has no boundaries on doing it right to have the best venue. And we know because of the audience that the Dallas Cowboys have relative to the NFL, we know that if we will do it right, there will be millions and millions of eyeballs looking at this stadium, both nationally and internationally, and looking at this event. So I want soccer to take advantage of my warped or my ambition here to do this thing as good as it can be done. I like that warped vision, right? There'll have to be an adjustment, though, made since the Cowboys play on artificial turf, but soccer demands natural grass. They have made that switch before. The Light Texas Aggies are in the College World Series, run the seven time in school history, looking for their first ever NCAA baseball championship. They would draw Oklahoma in the first round bracket and found themselves in a big hole early, down eight to nothing, the bottom of the second after giving up seven runs in the top half of that inning. But the Aggies bats finally come alive with two on Jordan Thompson out of Bernie Champ. He's able to ring up that three run home to lift. Left field here finally gets the maroon and white on the board with two outs in the inning to make it eight to three. But in the top of the fourth after the walk, walking the bases loaded, Jim Schlossnagel visits the mound to what appears to be a pitching change. But after a short conversation, he leaves Joe Men at the end. And that proves to be a huge mistake because of the very first pitch next. Jack Jackson Nicholas unloads on this fastball for a grand slam home run. And now the league grows to 12 to three over A&M. The final from Omaha. OU takes it. 13 to 8. Now, as a result, Oklahoma play the winner of Texas and Notre Dame. That game is being played right now. Notre Dame is up 1 0 in the first. Have the highlights of that game for you tonight on the night beat. Lots of swings and misses and swing for the fence. And it looks like they went through a lot of pitchers in that game right there. <laughs> so Aggies need some work. Awesome stuff. Thanks for that, Thank Greg. You. Now, next up, we're talking Juneteenth. San Antonio celebrating the holiday in a huge way this year. It's up next in our KSAT QA. Welcome back. Up until recently, not very many people heard of it, but that's changed now. Juneteenth is getting wide recognition. Now, basically, it commemorates the end of slavery in the U.S. Joining us now to talk more about that is Dr. Carrie Lattimore, Associate Professor of History at Trinity University. Dr. Lattimore, nice to have you with us. It's my pleasure to be here with you again. Yeah, so we know that Juneteenth is being celebrated in a big way in San Antonio this year. What do you think about this holiday finally getting the recognition that it deserves? I think it's wonderful for so many reasons. Number one, Juneteenth is really a type of humble um, celebration. So you have a group of people who were enslaved, they're freed, they keep it close to their hearts, they celebrate it, 
and 150 some odd years later, we now recognize what they did as a holiday. And that's the wonderful thing is that it's a family celebration. It's a group of people who celebrated together. And that's really what it's about is unity, family, community. Now, this holiday gained more traction after the police killing of George Floyd. What do you think we should remember for this holiday? Who? I mean, I think that Nelson Mandela's autobiography is called A Long Walk to Freedom. Mm -hmm. And one of the things in our nation is that sometimes freedom and liberty, it takes a long time. And you look at Juneteenth and, you know, the enslaved people, they were freed on that day. Many of them, a lot of them were not. And yet so many years later, the struggle still continues. And so when you think about that, I think that those are the things to take from it is that freedom is something that is fought for. We have to celebrate it, but we also have to remember that it, it sometimes comes with a price and with a struggle. And we have to work hard to ensure that freedom and equality and justice is for all. But we have to really work hard to ensure that those rights and privileges are for all people. Right, because it's not like slavery was over and everything was just gravy for African Americans. I mean, it was you had sharecropping. The limit to free song. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, sharecropping, Jim Crow laws, things like that. So I wanted to ask you about this because now we're seeing a lot of things. When you go online, you're seeing a lot of Juneteenth type theme party celebrations. You know, the intentions might be good, right? But right. often a lot of these holidays end up being commercialized and people think it takes away from the original purpose of what the holiday is supposed to be. So how do you think we can stop that from happening with Juneteenth? I think one of the ways that we can stop it is to look at the meaning of Juneteenth and to remember what it was all about from the beginning. And that means to go back to the foundations, to look at the Emancipation Proclamation, to look at what that didn't do, to look at how it took so many years for the Emancipation Proclamation to end up being extended into Texas and why. Um, and then to look at what Juneteenth meant and also didn't mean. So to go back to the roots, I think the commercialization is nothing that we can really do about that. It's gonna happen, but to go back to the roots of what that first Juneteenth was like, to remember the, 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 the happiness, but also to remember the difficulties that lay ahead. And I think that if we do that, we'll do justice to Juneteenth as a holiday. Just one thing that I noticed was when I was reading up on the history of Juneteenth, you know, the Emancipation Proclamation didn't take immediate effect, mm -hmm. which I think a lot of people don't realize. It's like, you'll be free in a few months. It wasn't, yeah, but, it wasn't, uh, you know, we signed it, you're good. And also remember that, um, you know, the Confederate States were in rebellion against the United States. And so Lincoln makes an order saying that all of the slaves in the Confederate States are free well, they're in rebellion against the Confederate States, mm -hmm. so they're not going to follow that order. And one thing that Lincoln also does is exclude um, many of the slaves that were in states that were in the United States or slaves that, and slave people that were in areas that were under control of the Union Army at that point in time. So the Emancipation Proclamation is a very political document, but it's a very important document because it puts the issue of slavery at the forefront and it makes this a war. It was always a war about slavery, mm -hmm. but it formalizes that. Going back to the root of Juneteenth, San Antonio is having many events for Juneteenth. Uh, IKEA and Live Oak had a history installation. The San Antonio African American Community Archive and Museum held another event today. There's going to be a number of celebrations at Comanche Lookout Park this entire weekend. Some people aren't as familiar with celebrations. What would you tell them before they go? Well, one, to learn a little bit about Juneteenth before you go but to also be prepared to eat well. <laughs> um, many of these uh, celebrations, you will eat very well. And so be prepared. Oh, just basically have a, I guess, an open stomach, open heart, open yes, mind, all absolutely. these things. Just skip breakfast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. You may, if, you, if it's early in the day, you may want to skip dinner as well. <laughs> all right, now, unfortunately, Dr. Lattimore, some people see African-American history as separate from American history, when it's all intertwined. How do you make people feel like Juneteenth is a holiday for every American? African-American history is American history. And American history is also African-American history. I celebrate the 4th of July. I'm happy to do so because my direct ancestors, my grandparents, my grandfathers, many times removed, were African-Americans who fought in the Revolutionary War. They, even though they weren't fully free, they were free African-Americans, but they weren't fully free. 
they saw something in this nation that they celebrated and they fought for it. Juneteenth is the same thing. When one person becomes free, we all become a little bit more free. And so we have to celebrate those small victories. And Juneteenth is not just a small victory. It was a big victory. But it was a day in which some people became free and our nation became better because of it. And because of that, we have to celebrate it. And African-American history is completely American history. It's the story of America. And American history is a story of the African-American and vice versa. Can't have so one without have the other. So we have to understand all of that. And when we do, we do justice to all of our history. And another big victory is the fact that Juneteenth is now getting so much more recognition as it should have many years ago. Yeah, it was just signed. It was a federal holiday as of uh, last year because of a presidential Biden. But Dr. Kerry Lattimore, we'll have to leave it right there. Thank you so much for joining us today, giving us some insight on this American holiday. We appreciate you being with us. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll be right back after this. Harming and Healing, a new interactive exhibit at the Witte Museum, explores how poison can actually do both of those things. Families can step into a Colombian rainforest and learn about poisonous animals and plants. Tiffany Huertas has an inside look. Paula is one of my favorite residents here at the Witte Museum. Paula is a Texas brown tarantula. You can find them throughout the state, and you can meet Paula at the Witte Museum's newest exhibit, the power of poison. She lives here all the time, and like many of the animals in this exhibit, is also a venomous animal. At this exhibit, you can travel through the Colombian rainforest. And you have the opportunity to explore uh, venom and poison in nature. And you can also learn how poison can heal. Poison that helps heal uh, some of the diseases, and scientists moving forward with using some of these venoms to create, hopefully, cures for some of these uh, ailments. This exhibit also has this enchanted book that explains poisonous plants and flowers with stories of how they've been used. To have the opportunity to be such an immersive experience that really puts you in the heart of some of these stories. The exhibit will be open until Labor Day. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. All right, now we're going to take a live look outside right now in our live cam. 97 degrees right now, looking pretty green out there, but yeah, it's still dry. We need some of that rain, Justin. Yeah, the, I, the, the tops of the trees are green, but you go down yeah, to the lawns and it's they're brown. crunchy. Yeah. yeah, a lot of dry lawns out there and stands to reason we just haven't gotten the rain that we needed. 96 degrees right now, as we mentioned, south southeast really winds at 10 miles per hour. Still some humidity out there, too, so it's a little sticky. Forecast as we head into this evening, 94 at 8 o'clock, 87 by 10 p.m. We're down to 84 by 11 p.m. Still a good southerly breeze out there. How does Father's Day weekend shape up? What does it look like for Juneteenth? We'll take a look at that forecast for you coming up. In the buzz today, the ultimate Disney dream vacation has just been announced. It's called Disney Parks Around the World. You can now visit all 12 Disney theme parks on a 24-day adventure if you can afford it. Yeah, and that's a big if. Yeah, because most of us can't. You know why? Tickets start at $110,000 a person. Who has that kind of dough? Seriously. Just underneath uh, the couch somewhere, yeah, underneath the mattress. Not really. According to the website, a private jet is going to carry 75 people from California to Tokyo, Shanghai, Hong Kong, India, Cairo, Paris, and then finally Orlando. The next trip is going to take place in July, and people can start booking for that later on this month. It won't be us. Yeah. <laughs> White rice, brown rice, cilantro lime, cauliflower rice, and now Mexican cauliflower rice. Sounds pretty good. Chipotle Mexican Grill is testing it out right now. It's grilled rice cauliflower has the same spices as the Mexican rice, including garlic, cumin, and paprika. It's made fresh every day. It's keto, vegan, vegetarian, paleo, and grain-free. But it may be a while before we can taste it here in Texas. As of now, only 60 restaurants in Arizona, Southern California, and Wisconsin are testing it. That Mexican cauliflower rice just reminded me that on top of the fact that I am really hungry, we could all eat more <laughs> vegetables, especially today because it's National Eat Your Vegetables Day. Now, U.S. health guidelines <laughs> recommend that we get at least three to five servings every day. So. Let's enjoy, right? Serve up a salad, chow down on some carrots. Just, you know, enjoy your veggies. You know, mm. farmers are also looking at that like, mm-hmm. Yep. That's also why we need <laughs> You were 
very excited for your veggies. I'm more of like the meat guy. Yeah, well, because I, I like them with like guac or salsa okay. hey, or stuff like that. Throw yeah. some salsa on it, makes everything just a little bit better. I was actually about to say my favorite vegetable is salsa. I count it as like one vegetable. <laughs> it you is. Throw some veggies in the blender, you. get it all mm -hmm. in there. Exactly. I'm it's all good about stuff. It. Yeah. Hey, uh, something cool, guys, to watch for as we head into the end of the month. You can actually see five planets in the sky, and those five planets uh, will show you here. It is uh, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, and they align just like you see them here, which is pretty cool. Now, you're going to have to go out just before sunrise in the morning. That's uh, when you'll be able to see this. Hopefully, uh, the clouds cooperate here. I don't think we're going to see a lot of cloud cover the next couple days, but you're going to look east to the east southeast, and you should be able to see these planets in succession. They'll be the kind of the bright, shining uh, stars you'll see up there. And uh, yeah, you may want to check it out. And as we get into uh, say June 23rd to 23rd to June 25th, we'll add the moon in there too, which is super cool. So check it out. It's a planetary party. Uh, as we look at the time lapse, uh, you can see we had some clouds this morning. Those quickly went away. Now we're looking at mostly sunny skies and a warm afternoon. 96 degrees. South southeasterly was at 10, gusting to 20. And temperatures are still in the 90s in most spots. 94 Kerrville, 91 Rock Springs, 99 in Del Rio. Some triple digits for Carissa Springs and Cotula are typical hot spots. And around Bear County, starting to see temperatures fall off just a little bit. 93 Helotus, 98 Stinson, 97 at Randolph. Here's the big picture, and most, notice most of Texas is dry, but East Texas is seeing some showers and storms this afternoon. They're trying to work west, not having a whole lot of success. A little piece of energy here. There's a weak frontal boundary as well, sitting uh, somewhere in southern Arkansas and across Mississippi and Alabama. But some of this energy will work towards South Texas. It's not going to give us the kind of rain you see there. Uh, we'll probably just see a stray shower or two. I really can't rule that out tomorrow, but chances are you're not going to see anything. If, if you see a shower, if you're lucky enough to get one, it'll be very quick moving. It won't put down much good rain, unfortunately. So we're still very much in this drought situation. But we will put in a 10% chance of rain on your Saturday. And we need the rain in the worst way. San Antonio International Airport has had 4.58 inches for the year. We are nearly 9.5 inches below average. Del Rio and Austin in the same boat. I mean, this has been a pretty bad drought year. One of the things we look for during drought years is maybe getting a little bit of help from the tropics. Doesn't look like we'll get that anytime soon either. We have Hurricane Bloss out in the Pacific. None of that moisture is making its way up to Texas. Uh, Tropical Storm Celia is moving away from land and same story there. And this uh, storm system we've been watching in the Caribbean, which has been very, very disorganized, uh, is also not showing any signs of organization. First off, only a 10% chance of developing, but also this moisture stays south of Texas. and. That means we're stuck in this, this pattern with a heat high controlling our weather. 94 degrees by 8 o'clock, 90 at 9 p.m. We'll be at 87 by 10 p.m. And notice the winds still a little bit breezy, anywhere from 10 to 20 miles per hour, a few gusts higher than that. 83 midnight, and then as we get into tomorrow morning, some clouds try to build back in at least briefly. 77, 4 a.m., 76 by 5 a.m. And the extended forecast. Uh, 101 Sunday for Father's Day and Juneteenth. If you do have plans to be outside, and celebrate, just know that the heat index may even be a little bit higher than that, so Yuck. that it's getting in that danger territory. And uh, summer officially begins next week, guys, and yeah, feels like we've been there for yeah, the last couple months. Yeah, it's not like, yeah, it's, and like I said before, this is just a taste of, we're gonna get, of what we're gonna get, maybe. I mean, chances are, we'll see these numbers go up a little bit more in July and August. You're the expert. Yeah. Thank you, Justin. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Texas is just preheating a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> in case you missed it, it's coming up next. It is June 17th, otherwise known as Friday morning. Nine men arrested in Kerr County following a multi-agency prostitution sting. Four of the suspects are from San Antonio. They're Stephen Gold, James Nunn, Nicholas Cuellar, and Christopher Carter. The other five suspects are from Kerrville, Lavernia, Fredericksburg, and Kingsland. The Kerr County Sheriff's Office says the men sought prostitution from either adults or minors and attempted to arrange meetups while communicating with officers. Charges range from solicitation of prostitution to online solicitation of a minor, among other things. They're all booked into the Kirk County Jail. 
Nine months after its musicians went on strike, the San Antonio Symphony is closing its doors. Despite the ongoing labor negotiations, the board announcing yesterday that it will file for Chapter 7 bankruptcy and dissolve the symphony. We are now one step closer to getting the nation's youngest children access to COVID-19 vaccinations. It's been a long process, but today the Food and Drug Administration officially approved emergency use for Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech vaccines for kids at least six months old. The move still needs some approval from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which is supposed to happen on Saturday. It's expected to pass since CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky has already signed off on this recommendation. If you're ready to shop for some good deals, mark your calendars for July 12th and 13th. Those will be the next Amazon Prime Days. That's right, the company announced the dates yesterday, saying the big sale will kick off at 3 a.m. and run for 48 hours in multiple countries, including Poland and Sweden, for the first time. You'll be able to save on electronics, toys, things for the house, clothes, and a ton of other stuff. All right, temperatures down to 94, so we're starting to drop off a little bit. We'll be up around 99 tomorrow. One one on Sunday. Small chance for a shower tomorrow. Otherwise, the forecast is a lot of the same. A lot of triple digits next week. Muy caliente is it. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you on the night beat. Oh, good night.